two or three, a thing is established. And we read a quote earlier tonight where Sister White says, the Lord does not repeat things that are of no small consequence. This 3-1 combination is repeated over and over and over and over again in the scriptures. Many times it's just a simple illustration. The three worthies in the fire and then Christ appears. But there are some lines, such as the ones that are illustrated on this chart, <clears throat> where they're more than simple illustrations, where you can gather together several of the waymarks. And the waymarks that you will typ typically see is that there's darkness that precedes the reform movement. Then there's a time of the end. And what's a time of the end? It's when a prophecy is fulfilled. And the fulfillment of that prophecy cast light upon the coming generation. Light that's going to test that generation. And when this, this light is cast, it's an unsealing of prophetic truth. It's an increase of knowledge. And you will find students of prophecy in that particular history that begin to study the increase of prophetic knowledge. At some point in time, that knowledge will be formalized. It will be put into an understanding that the Lord can use to hold that generation accountable for that truth. And then at some point in time, you will see a divine symbol come down, marking the empowerment of that message, and also marking the beginning of the testing process for that generation. They're being tested right from the very beginning. But once you get to the point where the little book is getting eaten, then you're in the, the black and white testing process. After that, you will see the activities of the enemies against that message. And in this history of this second way, Mark, where the activities of the enemies are illustrated, you will also see a manifestation of the power of God. And that concludes with the third way mark where you will see judgment illustrated. And the judgment is followed by a disappointment. And then there is a work given to God's people that they are to accomplish. And they always go into a backslidden condition. And in the backslidden condition, then you have the fourth way mark arrive. For us, it's the fourth angel's message of Revelation 18. For In the history of Christ, it was Pentecost. In the history of the three decrees, it was the fourth decree of Nehemiah. It's always there. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying everything about it. I'm giving you just a basic overview. Um, so, in the, this, the three decrees, the three decrees is what starts the 2300 year prophecy. Okay, and the beginning of a prophecy always, the history at the beginning of a prophecy always illustrates the history at the end of a prophecy. Okay, what starts the 1260 year time prophecy? What historical event marks the beginning of what marks 538 and allows us to put 1260 years on it? The, the Gothic, Ostrogoths are driven out of the city of Rome in March of 538, right? What marks the end of the 1260 year prophecy? When the pape, Pope is taken out of the city of Rome. The beginning of that time prophecy, the ruler is taken out of the city of Rome. At the end of that time prophecy, the ruler is taken out of the city of Rome. Jesus always illustrates the end from the beginning. The 398 one year 15 day prophecy of Revelation 9.15 begins when the last emperor of eastern Rome refuses to take the throne because he's scared of the four Ottoman sultans. So he surrenders his national sovereignty to four powers. That's the beginning of the 391 year 15 day time prophecy and it ends when the last ruler of the Ottoman empires surrenders his national sovereignty to the four great powers of Europe. The beginning of a prophecy, the history of the beginning always illustrates the end because Jesus is the beginning and the end and that's his signature in Bible prophecy. So in the 2300 year prophecy, the three decrees followed by the fourth decree of Nehemiah is the beginning and it's illustrating the three messages. The third message arrives in 1844, right at 2300 years after the third decree, right on time. And we're now in the time of the fourth message. In the middle of this history, We'll have to, there'll have to be darkness. We, I'm not trying to spend much time on darkness. But we all know that in the time of Christ there was darkness before he got there, right? The Bible says it, Spirit of Prophecy. There's darkness. And there's a prophecy in the Bible that identifies that Christ was going to be born 
okay, in the book of Isaiah. And at the birth of Christ, you have the time of the end in the history of Christ. It's a fulfillment of prophecy. The Messiah, the one that's to be the Messiah, is born. So when Christ is born, it's a fulfillment of prophecy. It's the time of the end for that generation. And at the birth of Christ, you should see an increase of knowledge on the message of that time. And the message of that time is that the Messiah is going to convert the covenant with many for a week. Where, when Christ was born, do we see any students of prophecy that are understanding the birth of Christ? The, the wise men? What did you say? Ah, I got in trouble for that. That's, that's how we, we, we say it in the United States. I, never th I just learned it growing up in the United States. The Bible in Spirit of Prophecy never says three wise men. It's just the wise men from the East. That's a Catholic tradition. And I said, that's how I said it too. And I'm in Europe and I said three wise men once and the Europeans just jumped all over me and said, no way. That's not in the Bible or the Spirit of Prophecy. It's not three wise men. Because in Catholic countries, at Christmas time, they always have three wise men dressing up like wise men going around asking for offerings through the city. So they know it's wrong. It's just the wise men. You also have Anna and Simeon in the temple understanding, right? You have the shepherds on the hill. You have students of prophecy at the birth of Christ that are understanding the increase of knowledge. And there's a message that's going to test this generation, but it has to be formalized. And Sister White often compares William Miller to John the Baptist. William Miller is the, the one the Lord used to formalize the message for the Millerite history. John the Baptist is the one that formalizes the message for his history. And the message of John the Baptist is empowered when the dove comes down at the baptism of Christ. And you know it's empowered because there comes a point in time in the history of Christ where the Pharisee, Pharisees have asked Jesus a, a question to try to put him on the spot. And he says, I'll ask you a question. Was the baptism of John of manner of God? And they couldn't answer. <laughs> he, he nailed it to the wall. If they said it was of God, then why did they persecute him? If they said he was a man, you know, the, the people thought he was a prophet, so they couldn't say anything. At the baptism of Christ, John the Baptist's message was empowered. Turn so, you, so I can make this point so you'll, you'll see it. To Matthew 3. In verse 1, it talks about John the Baptist coming. And, and what I want you to see here is that the foundational message in the history of Christ, this is the history of Christ here, the foundational message was delivered by John the Baptist. Okay, but notice verse 5. It says, Then went out to him, to John the Baptist, Jerusalem, and all Judea, and all the region round about. In the geographical setting of the history of Christ, John the Baptist's message was worldwide. Okay, all the region round about come out to hear John the Baptist. But notice the next verse, verse 6. Because John the Baptist gives the foundational message for that history. He says, verse 6, And were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. That was the foundational message there. Baptism, confession of sin. And when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto him, O generation, to them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Was there a wrath coming in this history? What was the wrath? What was the wrath that was coming in the history of Christ? The destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Jerusalem, Israel is about to be divorced of God and Jerusalem was going to be destroyed and part of the foundational message of this time period is there is a wrath coming. And who warned you Pharisees about this? Next verse. Bring ye therefore, therefore fruits meet for repentance. Repentance is part of the foundational message during that time period. And think not to say within yourselves we have Abraham our, for, to our father for I say unto you that God is able to of these stones to raise up the children unto Abraham, and now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree with which bringeth not forth good fruits is hewn down and cast into the fire. That was the message of that time, wasn't it? This was a history where ancient Israel was about to be set aside. They were about to be cut down, or if they repented, they could be part of the Christian church. That was the fa John the Baptist is given the foundational message. And then it says in, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, 
whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, and he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Was there going to be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in this history? Okay, so the reason I'm taking the time to go through that is, is for the foundation. The foundation is always laid in the first way mark. William Miller is the one the Lord used to assemble those foundational truths that are on the 1843 chart that we dealt with last night. We, we, if we're going to return to the foundations, and if we're going to be among those that restore the foundations, then we're going to have to defend what the foundations are. And one of your best defense is to be able to bring line upon line from the scriptures and say, William Miller has to be the one that raised the foundations because they're always lay, raised right there and then in that history. All right? And that's one of the reasons we're taking the time to look at, at this particular line of prophecy. You can see on the bottom of uh, page 9 a quote from Southern Watchmen where Sister White is identifying Miller um, in connection with laying the foundations. N on page 2 in the history of Christ the second way mark is always associated with the activities of the enemies and in this history the enemies in the history of Christ is when the Sanhedrin chooses that it's better for Christ to die than the whole nation perish. John 18.14 top of page 10 under local it says now Caiaphas was he who gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the whole people. All the region came out to hear John the Baptist in the the, in the first way mark of that history. But the second way mark will always have the activities of the enemies illustrated. The Protestant churches closed their doors on the Millerites in June of 1842. But the Sanhedrin chose that Christ should die. That's the second way mark. And in the second way mark you're also going to see a manifestation of the power of God. And at the triumphal entry into Jerusalem just before he was crucified, that was a manifestation of the power of God because the, the children were crying out, Blessed and Hosanna. And what did the Pharisees say? Make those children quit, be quiet. And what did Jesus say? The rocks will cry out. Now is that a manifestation of the power of God? And the triumphal entry is what Sister White uses to illustrate the power of of the midnight cry in the summer of 1844. They're lining up perfectly. The triumphal entry is lining up with the, the midnight cry. It's a manifestation of the power of God. In that, in that second way mark you're going to see a manifestation of the power of God and it always ends in judgment. And the judgment here is the judgment of the cross. Is the cross an illustration of judgment? And this third way mark is always followed by a disappointment. What's the disappointment after the cross? The disappointment of the disciples, right? And that's the history that Sister White uses to illustrate the disappointment of the Millerites on October 23rd, 1844. Right? And then they're given a work to do to carry the message of the resurrection to the world. But they decide to go fishing. And Jesus comes and tells them, I didn't call you to be fishers of fish, I called you to be fishers of men. It's a very weak illustration of a backslidden condition. But from the cross to Pentecost, you have 50 days. The inference is there. And on the other lines of prophecy, you can point to that. Because Pentecost is the fourth way mark in this history. Where the Holy Spirit is poured out. And of course, Pentecost is the classic illustration of the fourth angel's message, is it not? And we were given a work to do immediately after the disappointment. Proclaim the third angel's message. But we went into a Laodicean condition. We went fishing like the disciples. Alright. So down here, the three decrees we've already looked at, they were in darkness when they were in Babylon, were they not? Then Babylon falls, the 70 years is over. There's a a prophecy that's fulfilled marking the time of the end for that generation. Daniel is symbolizing the students of prophecy that recognized that as a fulfillment of prophecy. The one that is identified in this history that formalizes the message is none other than Cyrus. 
He sees himself named in the Bible and identified as the one that's going to let the Jews return to build Jerusalem. But he, he doesn't quite follow through. And in Daniel chapter 10, Daniel struggles with him, or, or Gabriel the angel struggles with him. He, doesn't, he can't prevail until Michael, a divine symbol, comes down and turns the tide for the first decree to be carried out. Then you have the, the decree to stop the work right here, paralleling the Sanhedrin choosing that it's expedient for Christ to die rather than the whole nation perish, paralleling the Protestants closing their door on the Millerites, and the second decree comes with Darius, the third decree with Artaxerxes, the disappointment of Ezra, the work to build, finish the streets and the walls, and that work is finally accomplished by Nehemiah. See it? I mean, I'm passing over the notes just so you can see it. Do you see it? Now I'm leaving a lot of stuff out too, but um, we read from Acts that Moses said the Lord's going to raise up a prophet like unto myself, right? Is that what he said? Moses predicted Christ. Moses is a type of Christ. And there was a reform movement in the time of Christ. When the children of Israel were in bondage of, in Egypt, was that darkness? Okay. Um, the, I, don't, I don't know if you've ever looked at it, but the, there's a, a time prophecy given by Abram, right? 400 years. 430 years in one place, 400 in another place. If you're very careful with that time prophecy, it's marking when it's fulfilled, the birth of Moses. And that's the time of the end in this reform movement. And the birth of Moses is paralleling the birth of Christ. And when Moses was born, there was an increase of knowledge illustrated by the fact that he's immediately taken in to the courts of Pharaoh and he begins to be educated in the school of Egypt. And who's, to, who's his teacher? His mother, and she's educating him in the ways of God. So he's, he's getting two types of education. There's an education illustrated there. And of course, when he gets older, um, he's being... The, the, there's an increase of knowledge because the Egyptians understand who he is. Um, there comes a point in that history where the message is going to be formalized, okay? William Miller formalized the message for this generation. John the Baptist formalized the message in the history of Christ. Cyrus formalized the message in the history of the three decrees. So, in the history of Moses, Moses formalized it, but where is the message put into a package in the history of Moses? Where is it formalized? at the burning bush. Okay, there's the message. You're going to go back to Egypt and you're going to let my get, take my people out of Egypt, right? But before he gets back to Egypt, if you read very carefully in Exodus chapter 5, I believe 6, 6. Before he gets back to Egypt, and Sister White comments on it. Go ahead. 4, okay. Sister White comments on this. It's in, in Exodus, it says the Lord came down. The Lord came down. Because Why? Because he hadn't performed circumcision on his son, right? And when Sister White comments on it, he said, if he had neglected that one duty, he would have not had the power to do the work in Egypt that he was going to do. And from the act of circumcision, he was empowered. Because when the Lord comes down, the message is empowered. When the dove came down, John the Baptist's message was empowered. When the angel of Revelation 10 came down, the Millerite message was empowered. When Michael came down in this history, that message was empowered. When the divine symbol comes down, the message is empowered. And we know at the end of the world, when the angel of Revelation 18 comes down, the third angel's message is empowered. Okay? Two or three is all you need. <laughs> and a thing is established. <laughs> So the message in the message for the history of Moses is that he's going to take his people out to worship. And by the way, these these messengers, Miller, John the Baptist, uh, Cyrus, not so much. Okay, but all you need is two or three to establish something. Every waymark is not. Some people insist every waymark should be found in these reform lines. And if you if you'd watch through the years these lines develop. You know, when we first started seeing these lines, they were empty. Okay, so uh, 
they keep developing. And some people say that every single way mark will be in every single line, and I'm still uncertain. I'm not going to be dogmatic about it, but perhaps that's so. I don't see the manifestation of the power in between the second and the third decree, but you don't have to. You don't have to. All you need is two or three times and it's established. And there's going to be manifestations in power in several of these lines, so it's established. But these, these men here, Miller, John the Baptist, and Moses, are reformers. This is something that you need to take note of. They're bringing a message of reform. And Moses brought a message of reform, which was the foundation of the message for his time. The message for his time was that the Lord was going to take his people out to worship and the reform message he brought back to Egypt was the Sabbath because the Jews had kept, weren't keeping the Sabbath. So, he, And the foundation of true worship is the Sabbath. So the, he lays the foundation right here for the messages of his time, right where it's supposed to be. And because he does so, what happens? Pharaoh gets really irritated. Because now the Jews aren't making the bricks seven days a week. So he says, well, you're just going to keep making the same amount of bricks, even though you're only working six days. But now you go ahead and you gather your own straw. That's the activities of the enemies right on time, trying to stop the work. Do you see it? <laughs> and then you should see the manifestation of the power of God as the plagues begin to fall on Egypt. <laughs> and what's the last plague? It's the, the judgment of the firstborn, is it not? And then you find that Sister White says, after Passover, after the judgment of the firstborn, that the Jews find themselves in a real bad place. The Red Sea's in front of them, and Pharaoh's army's behind them. And when Sister White says that, she uses this word. She says, the Jews were disappointed. Because Pharaoh's army was behind him and the Red Sea was in front of him. And when she uses the word disappointment to describe their condition, she compares it to the disappointment of the Millerites on October 23rd, 1844. Mm. Okay. And then they're given a work to do. And the work that they're supposed to do at this time, that's a shaky board, all right? <laughs> <laughs> That's, that spells work in some other language, okay? <laughs> the work that they were supposed to do at this point is to prepare themselves, sanctify themselves, because now Moses is going to go up on the mountain and do what? <laughs> Receive the law. Okay, so they're, they're given a work to do. Sanctify yourself against the morrow, because I'm going to go up on the mountain and I'm going to get the law, right? And he does that, but when he gets back, what's happened? They're backslidden. They're dancing around the golden calf. But he got the law, didn't he? When did he get the law? Fifty days after Passover, right? That's why it's called Pentecost. They were to commemorate the receiving of the law throughout all their generations, and they call it Pentecost because, because it came 50 days after Passover. And the way they commemorated it is by keeping Pentecost. Here in the history of Christ, the Pentecost of Moses is the identical day of the year as the Pentecost of the Jews. And the backslidden condition of them dancing around the calf is paralleling the disciples fishing, even though that's a very weak illustration. But the disciples had been given a work to do to carry the message of the resurrection to the world, just like the Jews had been given, given a work to do to sanctify themselves. And before they were given that work, they were disappointed by the Red Sea. The disciples were disappointed. And they were disappointed because of the cross. And the cross took place on the very same day of the year that the Passover took place. Now what I want you to see, there's an added argument here. The line of Moses is the beginning of ancient Israel. And the time of Christ is the end of ancient Israel. This is where Israel is going to be divorced. And therefore the beginning of ancient Israel is identical to the end of ancient Israel. Do you see it? So when we say that the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter at the end of the world, well, Adventism is modern Israel, and ancient Israel, the beginning of ancient Israel, was identical to the end of ancient Israel. So therefore, for us to say that the beginning of modern Israel is identical to the end of ancient, modern Israel, it's type and I type. It's proven all over the place. Do you see it? Okay. All right, now, I, that isn't a good study on this. We didn't read stuff, but I wanted, you to see, I wanted you to see two things. It's in this history 
that the foundations are laid. And every reform movement's the same. They're all the same. Every reform movement parallels the other ones. And let's go, I, I ask you to remind me, but I, I reminded myself, go to Isaiah 58, 12. Some of you were here last night, most of you were here last night, but some of you weren't. Last night we, we identified the truths that are on the 1843 chart as the foundation and platform of Adventism. And we identified that at the end of the world there is going to be a return that's accomplished by God's people. They're going to return to the foundations. Those are the old paths of Jeremiah 6.16. And those paths are the paths that we're to walk in if we're going to re find rest for our souls. And we used last night Isaiah 58, 12, where the last phrase says, it's telling us that the 144,000 at the end of the world are going to restore the paths to dwell in. And Jeremiah 6, 16 says the paths to dwell in is the old paths. And we're saying that the old paths are the foundational truths represented on the 1843 chart. But in Isaiah 58, 12, it also says in this work of restoring the foundational truths that the 144,000 are also going to, it says, and they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places and thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. And brothers and sisters, that's what we've been doing tonight. We've raised up the foundations of the Millerites. That's a generation. We've raised up the foundation of Christ. That's a generation. We've raised up the foundation of the three decrees. That's a generation. We've raised up the foundation of Moses. That's a generation. The 144,000 are going to raise up the foundations of many generations because their foundational work is to return to the foundations of Adventism but there's going to be an argument when you return there. That you're going to be, it's going to cause the shaking in Adventism. So the Lord's going to defend this truth by bringing line upon line from here a little and there a little to establish what the foundational truths of Adventism are because there's going to be a war over those foundational truths. And the unfortunate thing is, from my human perspective, the greatest majority of Adventism don't know anything about this war, let alone that the war is already it's hitting high gear. It's, like it's already getting bloody out there. All right. So, you can see some quotes will... We'll, um, like on page 15 from Testimonies Volume 8 you'll, you'll find the quote where Sister White's comparing the disappointment of Israel at the Red Sea to the disappointment of 1844 I ran through all that very quickly you have the quotes that you can consider afterwards now I'm going to go to um, page 18 I told you that we were going to deal with Isaiah 28 verses 9 through 13 some more. We started with that tonight and we pointed to the rest and the refreshing. But beginning in verse 9 at the top of page 18 it says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? Now brothers and sisters, that phrase there is very important to understand because Isaiah is speaking about the end of the world. And at the end of the world, there's going to be the reform movement of the 144,000. And every reform movement is the same. You may not, you haven't had time to test it perhaps, but you can see what I'm saying. But when I'm saying it's the same, you follow the logic, right? They're all the same. There's always a time of the end, an increase of knowledge, a message that's formalized, a message empowered. It tests that generation. There's the activities of the enemies and it culminates with the manifestation of the power of God and then judgment. Every time. And there's some other details that we haven't pointed out. So in Isaiah, and we're saying that when Isaiah 28 says, with a stammering tongues and another lip shall he teach to this people, we're saying that in each of these histories what's illustrated is that the men that the Lord ordained to finish the work, they never do. Did the Sanhedrin get involved with the, with the work during the time period of Christ? They never do. Was William Miller a a theologian or was he a farmer? They never do. And Sister White said over and over again in the last work, the Lord's going to call men from the common walks of life to finish the work. 
It's always the same. So when Isaiah says, with a stammering lip and another tongue, will the Lord speak to this people? It's consistent with all these reform movements. Those that are ordained to do the work, and I know I get in trouble for saying this, those that are ordained to do the work, they're always managing the corporation instead of paying attention to the unfolding prophetic light. And that's my point. The first phrase there is, whom shall he teach knowledge? And the reason that's important is because in every reform movement, there is an increase of knowledge. And the wise will understand that increase of knowledge, but the wicked don't understand it. And in Hosea 4.6, Hosea is speaking about the end of the world too. Hosea 4.6 says, My people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. So when Isaiah says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? This is a life or death question. Okay? This knowledge is what tests every generation. The increase of knowledge tests them. Okay? Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the breast. Go to page 19 from Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. It says, for when, for when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again the first principles of the oracle of God. We have more to read out of there. But brothers and sisters, if you drop down to the middle of the page where it says the time you ought to be teachers from Daniel 12, it says and they that Daniel 12:3 it says and they that shall be wise and underneath that passage in Daniel 12 it has the the definition of wise there and some some bibles in the marginal reference will tell you that the wise in Daniel 12:3 it's teachers Daniel 12.3 is talking about the time of the end when the book of Daniel is unsealed and there's an increase of knowledge and it's at that time that the wise will be teachers. So when Paul in Hebrew 5, back to the top of the page, he's, when he says, for when the time you ought to be teachers, and Paul's speaking about the end of the world like any other prophet, at the end of the world, when you're supposed to be wise, when you're supposed to be a teacher, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracle God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Is this true? At the end of the world, is the Seventh-day Adventist church sleeping in a Laodicean condition? Yes. You can say that with, an, with authority, because in every reform movement, before you get to the fourth and final way mark, God's people have quit doing the work. They're asleep. They're supposed to be teachers, but they're babes. You have to start all over with him. You have to teach him the milk of God's word. Now he's going to tell us what the milk is. He says, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, now he's going to tell us what the milk is. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God, of the doctrines of baptisms, of laying on hands, of the resurrection of the judge, and of eternal judgment. Or, brothers and sisters, if you were baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist church, you should be familiar with the 27 doctrines of Adventism, or 28, however you want to express them, because those are the milk of God's word. But at the end of the world, many Adventists aren't even familiar with that. And at the end of the world, you're supposed to be teachers. You're supposed to be wise. You're supposed to be no longer worried about those 28 doctrines. You already know those. Are, those are milk. You're supposed to be eating. The unfolding increase of knowledge that comes to every generation. All right? So if you go back to... Um, well, underneath, on the top of page 19, under present truth had a discussion last night with two brothers, spiritual and physical brothers, about a, a well-known personality in Adventism. And basically what I was commenting, they wanted to know my opinion of what he was teaching. And basically I used this quote on him. Says, From what I can tell, everything he's teaching is true. There are many precious truths contained in the Word of God, but it is present truth that the flock needs now. What is present truth? Present truth is the unsealing light that comes at the time of the end, at the end of the world, that is an increase of knowledge that's going to be understood by those that are running to and fro in God's word and that will test that generation. Now, it, 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 we don't have time to go in depth of that. I know I've already said that over and over again. But it can be demonstrated conclusively that 1989 was the time of the end. 
for the 144,000. Because in 1989, Daniel 11 verse 40 was fulfilled with the collapse of the Soviet Union, and it was identifying for Seventh-day Adventists that wanted to see that the final movements of prophecy that were going to return the papacy to the throne of the earth had began. The fulfillment of that prophecy opened up the fact that the papacy was about to take the world over one more time. The time of the end arrived for us in 1989. Here we are. We're almost over with the reform movement and we're still sleeping. The Laodicean sleep is a very comfortable and deep sleep. There are many precious truths contained in the Word of God, but it is present truth that the flock needs now. We don't need milk. We need flesh. Meat. The time that we ought to be teachers is now, the end of the world. And the teachers are the wise in Daniel 12. And there's two classes in Daniel 12. Brothers and sisters, the Millerites proclaimed the first angel's message. And verse 6 of Revelation 14 says the first angel's message is the everlasting gospel. Right? First angel's message is the everlasting gospel. And Sister Wright in Selected Messages says that the everlasting gospel of the first angel is the same gospel that was preached in Genesis 3.15. The gospel in Genesis, the beginning of the Bible, is the same gospel in Revelation, the end of the Bible. And in Revelation 3, Genesis 3.15, the gospel there is a promise that the Lord would put enmity between the seed of Satan and the seed of Christ. The, everlasting, the work of the everlasting gospel is to produce two classes of worshipers. It does it every time. The Millerites here, they proclaim the everlasting gospel, right? Because they proclaimed the first angel's message, but they experienced it. They experienced it. Because when they got to October 22nd, 1844, 49,950 continued to stay in the holy place and pray to Satan. They were the seed of Satan. And 50 moved into the most holy place with Christ. They were the seed of Christ. The everlasting gospel had been accomplished upon this generation and two groups had developed. That's what Sister White says. The 49,950, Satan was answering their prayers. The 50 moved in with Christ. Not only did they proclaim the everlasting gospel in this history, they experienced the everlasting gospel in this history, and what produced the two classes of worshipers was the increase of knowledge. That's what Daniel 12 says. Verse 10, Many shall be purified, tried, and made white. The wise will understand, but the wicked won't understand. Two classes. So when this history is repeated at the end of the world, <laughs> brothers and sisters, I've heard this often in Adventism. You probably have too. I hope you don't think it. There is no calling for Seventh-day Adventists to be among the redeemed. The calling for Seventh-day Adventists, there's only one calling for us. We can't just make it to heaven. We've been called to be the 144,000. That's why Sister White says, strive to be among the 144,000. I've heard Seventh-day Adventists say over and over again, oh, if I just make it to heaven, that's fine. That's not our calling. We have a different calling. Our message, our increase of knowledge, has to do with the development of the 144,000. And we, unfortunately, do not have the privilege or the right to just barely get into heaven. We've been called to be the 144,000. And in our reform movement... The increase of knowledge will test us just like every other generation's been tested. And when it's all over, there will be two classes of worshipers. Follow the logic? <laughs> Scary stuff. You see on the bottom of page 19, my people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. Okay, um, on page 20, where it says Isaiah 29, Isaiah 28 and Isaiah 29 are the same passage. And there are, there are many things to say about Isaiah 28 and 29. I'm not going to say them. Um, but notice the third paragraph. After she quotes from Isaiah 29, she says, Every word of this will be fulfilled. So 
that's one of the reasons I have this quote in here is to make sure that we understand. We don't need it. We, if we believe that all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world, we don't have to have Sister White telling us that every word of this particular prophecy will be fulfilled at the end of the world, but she does here. Okay, in Isaiah 28, um, verse 1 says, Woe to the crown of pride. What's a crown represent in Bible prophecy? Leader, leadership. Okay. To the drunkards of Ephraim. The leadership of Ephraim are drunk. And if you want to know who the leadership are, and I'm not going to spend time on this, but I'm going to point it out to us. It's verse 14. It says, Wherefore hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. And Testimonies, Volume 5, Sister White tells us where Jerusalem is at the end of the world. The drunkards of Ephraim are those that are ruling Jerusalem at the end of the world, according to Sister White. And there's a, there's a pronouncement against them for being drunk. And it continues on into verse 29, but before we get there, verse 14 of Isaiah 28 says, Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Because you have said we've made a covenant with death and with hell we are in agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through it shall not come upon us for we have made lies our refuge and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Now notice the next verse. Because this is about the end of the world and Sister White's clear Jerusalem at the end of the world is the seventh day Adventist church. Verse 16 says, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold I lay in Zion. Behold I lay in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, he that believeth shall not make haste. Judgment also will I lay to the line, and righteousness to the plummet, and he shall sweep away the refuge of lie, and the water shall overflow the hiding place. Brothers and sisters, the the truth that produces two classes of worshipers in Adventism has to do with the foundations of Adventism. And there's one group that, that doesn't want to go back to the foundations and their argument not to go back is a refuge of lies. Now in verse 20, in chapter 29, in verse 1, it's the same pronouncement. It says, Woe to Ariel to Ariel. Do you know what Ariel is? It's another word for Jerusalem. It's like you're living in Los Angeles here, but some people call it LA. Okay? Woe to Jerusalem. Woe to Ariel to Ariel, the city where David dwelt. Where did David dwell? Jerusalem. Add year to year, let them kill sacrifices. Now drop down to verse 9, because we're talking about the scornful men that rule Jerusalem, the drunkards of Ephraim. And, and verse 9 says, Stay yourself and wonder, cry out. And, and cry, they are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. They're not really drinking alcohol. They're drunk, but they're not really drinking alcohol. The Lord's going to tell us what they're drunk with. Verse 10, For the Lord hath poured upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and he hath closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers he hath covered, and the vision of all is become unto you as the word, words of a book that is sealed. What book sealed? In the Bible, what book sealed? The book of Daniel. Okay, now, now Isaiah is discussing the book of Daniel at the end of the world. And the vision, the, the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot read it, for it is sealed. At the end of the world, there's a group in Adventism that are symbolically represented as the learned. Who's the learned in Adventism at the end of the world? Well, it's the people that go to school right here, right? In Loma Linda and get their degrees or in PUC or in Walla Walla or in Andrews. Is that a fair application if Jerusalem is the Seventh-day Adventist church? And what's given to them is the prophetic book of Daniel. And someone says, tell me what it means. And they say, well, I can't tell you what it means because it's sealed. But... That's the, that's the leadership. We can't, we can't point no figures because notice the next verse. <laughs> and the book is delivered to him that is not learned. That's me and perhaps you. Here Adventism is divided into two class, classes. Those that are learned and those that aren't learned. And the learned are given the prophetic word at the end of the world and they can't understand what it is because they're drunk. Their drunkenness is identified as that their eyesight, their spiritual discernment, has been shut down, closed off. 
But then the book of Daniel is delivered to him that is not learned and saith, read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. Whoa. The learned in Adventism, they can't understand the increase of knowledge that's coming from the book of Daniel because they say the book is sealed. But the lay people in Adventism, they can't understand the increase of knowledge because they refuse to understand the increase of knowledge unless someone that is learned teaches it to them. Brothers and sisters, Bible prophecy is clear about where we're at. Where we're at is we were given a work to do right after 1844. And the work was to carry the third angel's message to the world. And we went into a Laodicean condition. And at the end of the world, when the fourth angel's message arrives, Adventism doesn't understand the prophetic word, the book that's sealed. The book that's sealed is Daniel and Revelation. And we're in a trap. We're in a trap. But the Lord, the Lord is going to speak to this people through stammering tongues, stammering lips, and another tongue. He will speak to this people to who he said, this is the refreshing and this is the rest. And how will he speak to this people? Line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. And brothers and sisters, to close this off, all these lines... Okay, all of them, when they come together, they're illustrating the end of the world. They're making the end of the world clearer and clearer. The clearest example of the end of the world is the history of the Millerites. But when you bring all these lines together in conjunction with the Millerite line, you have illustrated the line of the 144,000. And the line of the 144,000 is the generation that receives the latter rain. It's the generation of the rest, the generation of the refreshing, and it is illustrated, it is taught to God's people by bringing line upon line, line upon line. But what we're going to deal with this week is only two things that I want to keep in your head as we finish tonight. The foundations of many generations and that every reform movement begins with a time at the end. In spite of the fact that we've been led to believe that the time of the end is 1798 and for some reason we can't go any further, Sister White tells us every reform movement parallels the other one. And when we look at them in God's word, we find that there's always a time of the end. Any questions? Now, uh, I'm not... (laughs) I'm not, I, there's no way that, that I think I'm a good teacher, but the, what, I do have a technique even if it doesn't seem like it. And if you, haven't, if you haven't listened to any of the presentations that we do before, I'll tell you what I'm trying to do, even if I don't do it well. I'm putting a few concepts in place here the first few nights. They may not seem that related, but my purpose is, is to prepare a point of reference for, for all of us so when we get to the conclusion, we can really apply some things. So I hope you're not not being tempted to think this is just too scattered, too much information. I don't follow it because I think it'll come together by Thursday and Friday. Maybe not tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to be uh, tomorrow. We're going to deal with a lot of concepts. But by Thursday, when we go into the twenty-five twenty time prophecy, from there on out, it should be productive. Any questions? No? Brother John, you want to close with prayer for us? Amen.